Welcome back to a new series called The Most Powerful Black Man of the Last 500 Years Where we discuss life during the reign of King Henry Christoph, Commander-in-Chief of Northern Haiti from 1802 to 1820 until his death Now, make sure you stay up to date, go back, watch parts 1 through 7 so everything makes sense Part 1 through 4, we discuss the rise, the reign, and the downfall Parts 5 through 7, we started breaking out the official government letters, the official government documents. Now today, I got one of the most exclusive pieces of historical material. I have a letter written from the King of Haiti to the King of Russia, to the Emperor of Russia, the King of the Haitians, to the King of the Russians. Let's get into it. We're going to jump right in, not wasting no time. Let's go. King Henry to Emperor Alexander, to His Imperial Majesty of all the Russians, dated March 20th, 1819. Sir, fame has spread to the most distant countries. The report of the noble and generous feelings with which your imperial and royal majesty is inspired toward all nations. This universal benevolence has excited my admiration, which has been increased by the accounts I have received from my worthy friend, Mr. Thomas Clarkson, of the humane and beneficent disposition of your imperial and royal majesty towards the Africans and their descendants, the Haitians. My gratitude and respect for your virtues have inspired me with the desire of addressing this letter to your imperial and royal majesty as a tribute which I feel justly do. I have always believed that a sovereign so enlightened, just and humane, who in the midst of his conquests and victories gave the strongest proofs of justice and moderation must take a lively interest in the situation of the Haitians, that people who have risen from the midst of ignorance and barbarous slavery to the rank of a free and independent nation after having experienced the greatest misery and misfortune, and I am happy to see my hopes realized. Your imperial and royal majesty must undoubtedly be aware of the events which have taken place in my country during the last 30 years. It may, however, be well to revive in your memory the steps which have led the Haitians to liberty and from liberty to independence. I shall not fatigue your royal majesty with the afflicting details of the deplorable situation in which this nation was plunged before this period of freedom. How it groaned under the yoke of the most frightful slavery is well known to the world. The recital of its long misfortune and the picture of the horrible tortures that we experienced under the colonial government for more than 150 years would only wound your magnanimous generous soul. I therefore hasten to the period in which general liberty was proclaimed by the agents of the French government in 1793 and afterwards sanctioned by a legislative act of France herself and maintained for 12 years by mutual and uninterrupted intercourse, communication and correspondence between the two countries. During these 12 years of liberty which the people enjoyed with the French government, the virtuous general, Toussaint Louverture, then governor of the island, established laws, morality, religion, and under his paternal administration, commerce, agriculture, and industry flourished. And the European planters were not only protected, but respected in their habitations. The people had given unequivocal proofs to the metropolis of France, their attachment and devotedness, making it triumph over its numerous enemies, the British and the Spanish. After having braved misery, famine, and privations of every kind, Full of confidence in the French government, the Haitians were far from anticipating that after they had shed their blood in her service, France would reward their constant attachment and fidelity by depriving them of liberty 12 years after she had granted it to them. At the time when the Treaty of Amiens was negotiated, we imagined ourselves in the utmost security and were so far from apprehending the misfortune which threatened us that the governor, Toussaint Louverture, had sent almost all his troops to agriculture, flattering himself that he should enjoy in the midst of his family and fellow citizens the fruit of his glorious labors. When a formidable army suddenly overspread the country, sent with the criminal intention of destroying a peaceable and defenseless population or to plunge it again into the horrors of slavery. Your royal majesty would scarcely credit this excess of injustice had you not yourself sorrowfully experienced it. But the French were not satisfied with coming upon us as armed men. In order to secure the success of their expedition, they took shameful and duplicitous means to deceive the people. The proclamation of the French government declared, You are all equal and free before God and the Republic. Will its intentions and formal orders were for the establishment of slavery or our entire destruction. The people, deceived by these fallacious promises, gave themselves up without resistance, but scarcely had they extended their dominion by cunning and persuasion. Scarcely was Governor Toussaint dismissed from command when they seized him by the blackest treason in the retreat where he was confined, took him away with his family and a great number of his fellow soldiers and transported them to France, with the unfortunate chief, with these unhappy victims, worthy of a better fate, ended their days in dungeons and galleys. From this moment, slavery was proclaimed, a signal for proscription and massacre was given, gibbets were raised in all parts, funeral piles, bloodhounds, and the most horrible punishments were used to exterminate us. Your royal majesty cannot form a just idea of the atrocities and horrors that have been committed against us. None but those who have witnessed the scene can believe them. 
The barbarous acts by the French upon the Haitians have surpassed all crimes of destruction in the new world. After fighting many battles and at the expense of rivers of blood, we have driven these oppressors from our borders, notwithstanding all their efforts, and to secure ourselves from the repetition of such unheard of barbarian acts and crimes, such injustice and lies, the people of Haiti in the General Assembly proclaim their independence the 1st of January, 1804. During 16 years that the nation has enjoyed independence, it has advanced rapidly toward civilization and in continually improving its social situation. As soon as the reins of government were consigned to me, it became my first care to give my fellow citizens a code of laws suited to their wants and to their morals. I then felt the necessity and advantage of public education in order that the virtues inculcated by religion and morality might be practiced in their families and in order that they might appreciate the benefits of liberty. For this purpose, I requested my English friends to send me schoolmasters, professors, and artists in order to diffuse the arts and sciences and viewing their progress I already gather the fruits of my labor by the encouragement that I give to marriage and protection to good morals I have the satisfaction of seeing a sensible amelioration every day in our situation depraved morals the bitter fruits of slavery and ignorance disappear every day agriculture has received all possible encouragement by the multiplicity of farms commerce and industry prosper labor is honored as the source of all blessings i trust that the motives which inspire me will influence your royal majesty to excuse this apology for my labors too long has the african race been unjustly attacked too long has it been represented as deprived of intellectual faculties as scarcely susceptible of civilization and government by regular and established laws these false assertions spring from the avarice and injustice of men who have the impiety to degrade the finest work of the creator the black man and woman as if mankind had not one common origin these persons attribute to difference of color which is that only the result of civilization and knowledge the religious principles and superior intelligence of your royal majesty enable you to feel better than I can express these internal truths. And when in the council of the kings of Europe, you condescended to speak in favor of the Africans, you proved to the world that your noble heart was penetrated with the sublime truth of morality and religion. In the effusion of my gratitude and the admiration with which the virtues of your royal majesty have inspired me, I thought that I cannot do better than to address myself to the most illustrious protector of the African cause, that I might open my heart to him, tell him the situation of the people who have confided their destiny and their dearest interests to me, and to disclose to him my projects for their happiness. In the bloody contest which your royal majesty has had to support against the unjust aggression of France, we have not ceased to offer our prayers for the success of your arms, and we cherish the hope that when a general pacification took place in Europe, the people of Haiti would have partaken with the other nations in the blessings of peace. Instead, for 16 years, we have been obliged to be continually on the watch until our independence should be acknowledged by France. When the government of France was changed, we hope that the cabinet of His Majesty Louis XVIII would have been directed by principles of moderation, justice, and humanity, and that he would have acknowledged the independence of the people of Haiti. But that was a vain hope. He openly showed his disposition to make use of the same system of duplicity and lies that the preceding cabinet had employed. Europe knows that without the latter events which have taken place, we should have had to sustain a war of extermination with France. I shall not suffer myself to enlarge further on the subject. I fear that I have already trespassed on the precious time of your royal majesty. I believe I have sufficiently informed you of our situation to authorize the hope that you will grant your powerful and generous protection and benevolence to the cause of the Africans as well as the people of Haiti. It is in their name that I have the honor of addressing myself to your royal majesty and that I beg you to accept this testimony of our great respect and gratitude and of the admiration which we feel for your virtues, Henry. So yes indeed, the king of the Haitians to the king of the Russians official government documents official government letters king henry introducing himself and giving emperor alexander a rundown of the situation let's get back into it the next letter is bound of asti to thomas clarkson as we know bound of asti one of the high members of the kingdom of haiti high members of government one of the high members of the privy council one of christoph's advisors i believe we introduced him in part one one of christoph's close friends bound of asti to thomas clarkson March 24th, 1819. Dear Sir, Mr. Burt has been so kind as to offer to deliver my correspondence, so I am taking advantage of the opportunity to write you this letter. Since the ship is to sail for England tomorrow morning, and my health is not all that good just now, lack of time and of strength will prevent my expressing myself as fully as I should wish to have done with a person like yourself. My dear sir, who has always shown himself to be the sincere friend of humanity and the zealous champions of the Africans and the Haitians, their descendants. I have never for a moment forgotten the wise advice you gave me in your last letter, and I can hardly find words to express my gratitude. I beg of you, sir, to continue enlightening me with your counsel. You can never write at too great length about anything related to our national interests, nor will you ever be able to realize what an eminent service you render us when you explain the underlying principles of government and guide us along the path of wise and good policy. 
Sound counsel, says the proverb, is worth a thousand men. Each time I read your letter, I again appreciate the truth of the axiom. I have the honor of presenting you with a copy of my political reflections as a small token of my respect and admiration for you. The book is drawn from my observation of the internal and external situation of Haiti. You will understand my motives and will appreciate my fears and hopes. I beg your indulgence toward the errors which the work must contain in large numbers. You will surely pardon me in light of my good will and inexperience. It is certainly unnecessary for me to urge upon you the importance of your concern for the cause of Haiti and of the aid which I am requesting so insistently. For you know even better than I do what serious consequences a grave political blunder can have since I may any day now find myself forced to make a decision. Your wise suggestions will be infinitely precious to me. I have the honor of sending you along with this letter a report on the national schools which are already functioning. We intend to establish a school in each parish. You will also receive the king's proclamations regarding public education with renewed assurance of profound respect and veneration i have the honor of remaining sir your most humble friend bound of asti next letter king henry to thomas clarkson 8th of june 1819 this one seems short worthy and respected friend with one of my letters on the 20th of last march i sent you a copy of the letter from the french general de vincent addressed to count limonat my minister and secretary of state i also sent a reply which had been made to De Vincent. Scarcely had my letter to you been dispatched when my minister received another communication from the same general, much more aggressive than the first one. For that reason, I judged it best not to send De Vincent the answer which had first been prepared. I am now sending to you, along with the present letter, a copy of De Vincent's second communication, as well as the reply which I had drawn up, which will be dispatched very shortly. I am again asking you, my friend, as I did in my letter of March 20th, to express yourself very frankly and tell me what you think of the matter. I need your advice and the wisdom of your experience and shall await them with the anxiety which the seriousness of the subject justifies. Allow me to renew, my friend, my best wishes for your good health and the assurance of my esteem, friendship, and veneration. Henry. Next letter. Thomas Clarkson to King Henry. June 28th, 1819. I received your majesty's letter of the 20th of March, which was brought to me by Mr. Burt. I read with interest and satisfaction the letter which you enclosed to me for the Emperor of Russia. Nothing could have been more proper. I send it without delay to Count Levin, the Russian Emperor's ambassador in London, and also your prince enlisted in national schools in Haiti. I also wrote a letter to the Emperor. Since that time, I have received an answer from Count Levin, in which he promises that he will forward my packet to the first dispatches on their way to Russia. I have the pleasure of informing you that our great cause, the abolition of the slave trade, is in a progressive state. The Spanish slave trade will now soon be at an end. That of Portugal will then only remain. In November, last, the kings who were assembled at France did not think it right to adopt at once the severe measure of making this trade piracy, but they determined to call the attention of the king of Portugal towards it, and accordingly, they wrote to him an affectionate letter, signed by their own hands, conjuring him to give up, as the rest of Europe had done, the abominable slave trade. In March last, a new event occurred in our favor. The government of the United States had long ago decreed the abolition of the slave trade, and they punished such of their citizens as they found violating the law at home, but they never followed up on the decree as the English had done by arming cruisers with the view of punishing those who have violated abroad. This error they have now repaired, for in March last they passed an act by which they voted $100,000 for equipping vessels of war to capture their own slave vessels wherever they can find them on the high seas. Their vessels are to go to the coast of Africa and other parts of the world for this purpose. On the 20th of February last, I wrote to your majesty concerning a plan which was then the agitation of sending the free people of color who live scattered around different parts of the United States to Haiti. That unhappy distinction between black and white, which originated from the slave trade, follows them wherever they go, except among the more liberal and religious, so even though they are citizens of the United States, they are looked upon in a degraded light. They are also subject to be stolen, dragged away privately, and sold into slavery in the southern United States, though the law would punish the aggressors if they were to found out. Their situation being such, a number of worldly persons in the United States Friends to the abolition of the slave trade formed themselves into society some years ago for their own protection. These societies have been accustomed to send deputies every three years to hold one common meeting at Philadelphia. Here they report everything that has come to their knowledge relative to these poor people and here also they resolve upon new measures as they think most likely to improve their condition. The last of these triennial conventions took place at Philadelphia in December 1818. It seems to be the opinion of the deputies that the most satisfactory and permanent way of providing for the free people of color would be to send them to Haiti, provided they are willing to go there, and your majesty or General Boyer would be willing to receive them and grant them land and citizenship. It was resolved accordingly that the president, Mr. Peters Jr., 
should open a correspondence with the influential and philanthropic individuals of Europe on the present state of Haiti to promote such arrangements as will render that island a safe asylum for the free people of color who choose to immigrate there. In consequence of this resolution, Mr. Peters has opened a correspondence in England on this subject. I wrote him a letter and advised him not to think of obtaining information relative to Haiti from England, but to assemble the convention and to recommend to it to send one or two persons on whom it could rely direct from Philadelphia to Haiti to communicate in person with your majesty there. I assured him that you would receive these deputies and converse with them with your usual frankness, that you yourself would give them all the information they desired and much more than they could receive in England, and that you would treat them with all due respect and attention, not only on my account, but because you had a regard for all those who are friends of Africa and their descendants. I told him also that in order to remove all difficulties, I would enclose him a letter of introduction to your majesty. This letter I wrote accordingly. The whole matter resolves itself in two questions. The first is whether the immigration of the people of color is to be on a large unlimited scale, that is, whether they are willing to go there either now or at a future time, so that Haiti may be considered as a constant asylum for free people of color. In this case, your majesty would have a right to stipulate that the American government should buy the Spanish part of the island and cede the whole of it to you, or a part of it, according to the proportion of the population you would be willing to receive. And I have no doubt that the American government would be willing to treat with the Spanish government for this purpose. This stipulation, if acceded to, would be of great advantage to your majesty because you would then be relieved of all fear from France directly or from France buying the Spanish part of Haiti and colonizing with Frenchmen. The second question is whether the immigration before spoken of will be only upon a small and limited scale. In this case, I think that the American government would not consent to purchase the Spanish part of Haiti. It is therefore for your majesty to consider how far you would be willing to take a limited number without the compensation of the Spanish part of the island. It must be obvious, however, at the first sight, that such an addition to your population would strengthen your own government, both at home and in the eyes of foreigners, and of France in particular. You would also be able to realize more rapidly your project of introducing the English language into Haiti, because all the free people of color speak that language. Many of them also would be very valuable to you, because they are skilled in different trades, and if only two-thirds of them were to be put upon farms, cultivation would be going on to a considerable extent, while you would not be obliged to disband your current military. There is one consideration particularly worthy of your majesty's most serious attention. If you yourself should be unwilling to receive the free people of color without the stipulation in question, it is probable that General Boyer would be glad to take them upon any terms and that he would thus be making a very formidable addition to his population, which you would not like to see in your own neighborhood. I come now to a very important part of your majesty's last letter, and I only wish that I had the ability to answer it, either to your satisfaction or to my own. I told you, upon the authority of the Duke of Wellington, that the French government had given up all idea of making a conquest into Haiti, but that an attempt was to be made to obtain this trade by means of some treaty to be proposed. General Vincent's letter, a copy of which you sent me, seems in some degree to confirm this statement, but I am more convinced of the truth of it by what passed a few days ago in the Chamber of Deputies in France. On Monday, June 7th, a discussion took place there relative to the sums of money to be voted for keeping up the French marine and colonies. Among those who spoke was Monsieur Velvic, who in the course of his speech alluded to Haiti. He gave it as his opinion that if a constitutional regime were offered to the blacks there, I use his own words, the government might succeed in restoring to France the colony of Saint-Domingue formerly so flourishing. The Minister of Marine and Colonies immediately rose up. He deprecated any illusion of this nature on account of the delicate situation of the relation of France with Haiti. I judge from this very short conversation either that the French ministers had at that moment some proposal in view which they intended to make to your majesty and General Boyer relative to your commerce or that they had already sent off to you or to both of you some proposal to that effect which was then on its way to Haiti. But whether my conjecture be right or whether it be wrong, I am persuaded that, though the French government has wisely abandoned the idea of using force against Haiti, it will never give up the idea of having some right to the advantages of commerce, and as money to be voted every year in the French Chamber of Deputies for the expense of the Marina colonies, I feel certain that whenever this vote is proposed, some deputy, like Monsieur Velvic, will rise up with some resolution or other unfavorable to the independence of Haiti. It is therefore evident to me that sooner or later, some proposal must be made to your majesty by the French ministry on this subject. And I think it will be proper for your own peace of mind to set the matter at rest by speedy determination on your part, either to refuse or to agree to a treaty with the French government. I confess my own inability to advise you for the best in this affair. I will, however, throw out a few ideas for your consideration, after which your majesty will adopt your own course. I shall begin by taking it for granted that your majesty proposes to adhere to the grand fundamental proposition laid down in your declaration on the 20th of November, 1816. 
that you will make no treaty with France, but upon the acknowledgement of Haiti, and that this treaty shall be conducted on both sides after the manner and usage of two independent nations, and that this treaty shall not be considered as valid until it be guaranteed by the English government. I may now observe that there can be but two kinds of treaty between your majesty and the government of France. You must either admit France to a participation of your commerce with other nations, or you must admit her to a monopoly of your commerce, and thus exclude all other nations from it. Let us suppose for a moment that you offer her the first kind of treaty. I think that the French government ought to be satisfied with such a treaty. It would be unreasonable in France to expect that you should abandon all intercourse with other nations with whom you have been long on friendly terms, and whom you have had reason to esteem. Let it be remembered also that at this moment no French vessel is allowed ever to enter your ports and no Frenchman ever to land upon your soil. The permission therefore of these to come and trade with you must be a great change in favor of France. Now I'm sure that England if called upon would very readily guarantee such a treaty as this for France having once acknowledged the independence of Haiti, England would feel no fear or indelicacy by offending an ally. And besides, England would have an interest in the guarantee as your majesty would have reserved for her a part of your commerce. You will be placed then in very happy circumstances if all these objects could be realized. You would then have a treaty on an equitable basis. You would have given to France a part of what you considered to be forever lost. You would not have offended any of your former friends. You would have secured the acknowledgement of your independence and you would have obtained a powerful guarantee at the same time. Now suppose that France, not satisfied with the participation of the commerce, would insist upon a monopoly of it and that you would agree to the demand in what situation would your majesty stand? In the first place, you would have turned your back upon your old connections. Should a war arise between England and France, many of the vessels which supply you with articles of trade would be captured, and you would not be able to replace your cargoes from other parts. Perhaps your very ports would be blockaded. You would have gained, indeed, the acknowledgement of your independence as it relates to your government, but you would have lost your independence as it relates to your commerce. But how could even the independence of your government be secured without a guarantee? And with what hope could you ask England to guarantee it, if you should have excluded her from the advantages of your commerce? Your majesty will see by the foregoing statements that there would be a very material difference between the effects of the two treaties. At the same time, I candidly acknowledge that if the salvation of Haiti, that is, the preservation of her independence as it now exists, could be really secured, and could only be really secured by granting to France a monopoly of your commerce, I would advise your majesty to grant it. For what is England or any other country you have compared with your own independence and the liberty and the happiness of your people? Hold up. Do you hear the advice that Thomas Clarkson is giving to Christoph? He's basically telling Christoph to sell out, you see? And he's the same one that told Christoph to also disband his military, decrease the size of the military. So you see, even though he's on payroll, he's Christoph's European advisor. In my opinion, this is terrible advice, but let's get back into it. The great difficulty which I see in a treaty which should give to France a monopoly of your favors would be in finding a guarantee for it on the part of England, and yet I think there are circumstances which might induce England, even though you excluded her from your commerce, to become a party of such a treaty. You are well acquainted with the eternal situation of our West Indian islands. They are peopled by men who have been robbed of their liberties, and who by the laws of nature have a right to regain them, if they can. Our islands, therefore, are full of combustible materials, and you have only to apply a candle to them to set them on fire. Any king of Haiti with a powerful population could command their destruction at any time. Our government knows this. Our West Indian merchants and planters know it also, and hence the latter have a jealousy and fear of your majesty's rising greatness. I am of the opinion, therefore, that even though you may exclude England from your commerce, her government might be induced to guarantee a treaty of monopoly with France, provided you would bind yourself in the same treaty, not to molest any of our West Indian islands as now established. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Thomas Clarkson is basically saying, listen, if you agree to a deal with France, giving her a monopoly over your economy and your commerce, then England would have no reason to guarantee the treaty or even do business with you if you're going to exclude her from the commerce. But what you do have is your proximity to our Caribbean colonies. And at any given time, you could raise your army and conquer those colonies at any given moment. So you could use that as a bargaining chip when you step into negotiations with the British Empire in order to guarantee the treaty. Now, I think the treaty is garbage, you know what I mean? And in fact, later on, you're gonna see that Christoph actually replies, or if not Christoph, one of his secretaries, actually replies to Thomas Clarkson's suggestions to give France a monopoly, in which they say, in simple terms, we ain't paying a dime, we ain't giving nobody monopoly over nothing, we ain't doing nothing, we ready for war, we ready for blood, we spill blood for this independence, and that's what it's gonna be. So obviously, you know, Christoph's government is not gonna be with it, but as we know, General Boyer in the South, the Mulatto Republic, they with it. They're already in negotiations at this time.
let's get back into it. If your majesty should make a treaty with France, but particularly an exclusive one, I think you ought to stipulate that no French troops should ever be allowed to land on any part of Haiti. And number two, that no French ship of war should be allowed to enter its ports, except it should bring dispatches to your majesty or be forced there by want of provisions or stress of weather. And that you should be allowed to be neutral in time of war. Okay, so hold up. So even though white boy Thomas Clarkson giving terrible advice, basically telling Kristoff to sell the country away, he did clean it up at the end by trying to tell Kristoff, listen, you can sell the country away, but just don't allow any French ships of war to land in the ports or never allow the French military to set foot upon Haitian soil. But if you gave the country away, you gave the commerce away, you gave the economy away, what does it matter if the troops are going to land? They already got what they want. They already got the money. So it is what it is, man. Let's get back into it. I am of the opinion also that your majesty would do well to make it a fundamental law of the realm that no Europeans should purchase land or reside in the interior of the island. It is sufficient if you allow them to make purchases and to reside at Cap Henry or other maritime places for the purpose of carrying on their trade. But if you have no such fundamental law, it is possible that the French, when once admitted into your maritime towns, might under the pretense of examining, purchasing, or cultivating land for plantations, creep out of the towns and spread themselves by degrees in your villages for the real purpose of overthrowing the government. Now the term Europeans would include the French, though it would not have the hateful appearance of being leveled against them in particular. And if this were made a fundamental law of Haiti, before you entered into the treaty, the French government would be obliged to respect it as a law of the realm, existing with the acknowledgement of your independence. I am also very much pleased to find that Prince Saunders has been representing your majesty's government in a very positive light to the citizens of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, and other places, the consequence of which I hope will be that they will be disposed to offer you a very considerable part of the population of the free people of color should they be sent to Haiti. Thomas Clarkson. Next letter. The Count of Limonade to Thomas Clarkson, Secretary of State, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Member of the Royal Chamber of Public Education, the Honorary Member of the English and Foreign School Society of London. You know what I'm saying? Big dog. You know what I'm saying? Count de Limonade. What up, big dog? This is one of the high ranking members of Christoph's government in the Kingdom of Haiti, writing to Thomas Clarkson, as we know, British diplomat. Let's get into it. 25th of July, 1819, at the palace. Dear Sir, I have been kept from the pleasure of writing you by a long and painful illness, which has made it impossible for me to work and to serve my beloved king. Now that I am well again, God be thanked. The fact that my first letters are written to you and the friends of the cause makes it an even greater satisfaction to resume my ordinary occupations. I congratulate you heartily for your zeal, for going into the Congress of France so that you might serve the cause that you have so long championed with the warmth and energy of the virtuous. And secondly, for your speech before the illustrious kings assembled there and your conversations with the Emperor of Russia, the esteemable character of that honorable king and his goodwill towards Haiti merit our gratitude and veneration. But you, how can we ever repay you for all that you have done for us and our African brothers and for all that you still intend to do for us? We well know then, sir, that in the quiet of our heart, you will enjoy a sense of self-satisfaction, our blessings and those of our posterity and the certainty of heavenly reward. His majesty writes to you, opens his heart to you, and has as much confidence in you as in himself. Please believe, sir, that my wishes for your health equal my respect and affection for you. Count de Limonat. Next letter. King Henry to Thomas Clarkson. Apparently, Christoph wrote this letter inside the Citadel, 29th of July, 1819. The King to Mr. Thomas Clarkson. My worthy friend, when this letter reaches you, you doubtless will have already received my preceding communications, which were entrusted to Mr. Burt. I understand that Mr. Burt has arrived safely and has already delivered the first of these two communications. Along with this letter, I am sending you a duplicate of the second. Since I last wrote, I have received several indirect messages from agents of the French government urging me to come to an understanding with France. I have not seen fit to answer on a subject of such importance without having first benefited from your wise advice. Your suggestions are therefore being awaited so that I may make a decision. For allow me to repeat, if I could be certain that Great Britain would recognize the independence of my country, I should pay no attention to these overtures which are being made. I read attentively your remarks concerning the emigration of the colored people from the United States and appreciate fully what you say about the advantages and disadvantages which might result. Approaches have been made to me from the United States by several persons, in particular by the president of the Emancipation Society of New York. I have replied only to the letter and am sending you a copy so that you may know my views on the subject. I have heard nothing from Mr. Prince Saunders since he left Haiti by stealth and feel that I owe you this word of warning in case he should try to take advantage of you using my name. We dealt with him most generously during his stay among us. Since I last wrote, 
we had been visited by Sir Homerick's Puffam of the Jamaica station, and we received him in a manner befitting his rank. I gave him a personal audience. While he was there, he was encouraged to visit our institutions, our hospitals, and the interior of the island. No doubt, he has informed his government the conditions he saw in Haiti. Shortly after the departure of Sir Homerick's Puffam, Commodore George Collier, commander of the African Coastal Station, spent some time here on his way back to England. He gave us very gratifying information concerning the progress toward civilization which our African brothers in Sierra Leone are making. To my own great satisfaction, through him, we learned that our friends are forging ahead and we continue to hope that all their efforts will be crowned with success. I'm assuming around this time, this was when there was a lot of repatriation projects, a lot of people trying to go back to Africa and set up societies for free people of color. I think around this time, Liberia was popping up, Sierra Leone was popping up. So I guess that's what Christoph is mentioning when he's talking about our African brothers in Sierra Leone. You know what I mean? So let's get back into it. Acting in accordance with your wise suggestions for the improvement of my country's agriculture and reassured by the fact that certain highly placed individuals have informed you that the French will not undertake any hostile action against Haiti, I have judged it advisable to take advantage of the favorable moment and put into effect a project which has long been very dear to me, that of giving all members of the armed forces concessions of land from the public domain. You will see in the public papers which I am sending you that when making this distribution, I did not depart from the plan which you proposed to me. I shall begin, little by little, to familiarize my troops with the transition from the soldier's life to that of the farmer by giving them leave, a group at a time, to go and cultivate their land for brief periods. Then, when I can do so with complete security, I shall go even further and carry out in its entirety your plan of maintaining only a militia. You see, my friend, how much value I attach to your kind advice, as well as that of our common friends, Wilberforce and Stephen? Please believe me when I tell you that I have always agreed heart and soul with you. However, my position is really difficult since I simply must guarantee the safety of my fellow citizens and relieve their fears concerning the future. I shall not fail to keep you informed as to the results of this experiment. It is with regret that I announce to you that Reverend Mr. Morton, professor of the French and English languages, disregarding his promises and alleging the most frivolous of cases, has requested permission to leave for the United States, though he has been given absolutely no reason for complaint because it has always been against my principles to make anyone remain who wish to leave. I have granted his request and have him replaced by Mr. Daniel, master of the National School of Sun Souci. A well-prepared monitor is taking Mr. Daniel's place. Hold up, hold up. So you see, Christoph, he juggling so much, bro. He juggling internal affairs, external affairs. You know, a teacher just put in a notice, say he wants to quit, go to the United States. If you notice, Christoph is hands on from everything all the way to the top, dealing with foreign governments, all the way to the most minute things domestically like appointing and hiring and firing people who work in the schools if you notice they even say Christoph is actually even present on construction sites you know what i mean like he's all over he's everywhere he's in the schools he's at the construction sites he's in the fucking palace bro he's everywhere let's get back into it the interior of the island is completely tranquil word did reach me that general boyer had sent troops against the count of jeremy in the mountains of jeremy as for myself i assure you that i have no intention of committing any hostile act against General Boyer. You may therefore boldly deny the rumors which may have circulated to the effect that I am plotting an attack against his part of the island. I shall continue to rely on you, my friend, to keep me informed about all developments which I should know about. Please believe that my concern for your health and happiness is as great as my esteem for you. Henry. Now, hold up. When it says that General Boyer had sent troops against the Count of Jeremy, as we know, it's only in Christoph's territory where people have these royal titles, you know, Baron, Duke, Count. So how did General Boyer send troops against the quote unquote Count of Jeremy? The town of Jeremy is a town within General Boyer's territory in the south. That is a southern Haitian town. So why is there someone in the southern territory, the Republic, the territory of General Jean-Pierre Boyer? Why do they have a royal title? And why did Boyer have to send the troops against him? That is because Christophe was funding all type of little insurrections and rebellions trying to overthrow that part of the island. The Count of Jeremy is a man named Goman, who pretty much was a general that was acting on the orders of Christoph to basically overthrow that territory and gather a rebel force down there. Now, of course, he was defeated. Like we said, General Boyer sent the troops after him, but Christoph did not directly intervene because like he said towards the end of the letter, Christoph said, I do not want to commit any hostile act directly against General Boyer. So technically, kind of how the United States is doing with Ukraine, like they're not directly going against the Russians, but they're funding a military force on that side of the world to go against the Russians. That is what Kristoff was doing. He was funding certain rebel groups in the South, in the Mulatto Republic in the South. 
and they were going against General Jean-Pierre Boyer. But in this case, they said, obviously, the general was defeated. The Count of Jeremy was defeated. Let's get back into it. Next letter, the Count de Limonade to Thomas Clarkson, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Secretary of State. This is one of the high-ranking members of the government, like I said, writing to Thomas Clarkson, British diplomat. Let's get into it. Dear Sir, the King, my beloved sovereign, had the pleasure of writing you the 28th of last July. I also had the honor of writing you on that same day. Today, I'm taking this occasion to send you a work just published by Baron de Vasti. In it, you will find authentic details concerning the history of our country and a study of the character of the king. You will find, easily refuted, I believe, the scandals referring to his person, which the enemies of the African race have delighted in spreading. In short, I believe that you will discover new reasons for esteeming him ever more highly. You will see in his majesty a man frank, upright, patriotic, loving his fellow men of his country. I have the honor of signing myself with all possible consideration, your faithful friend, Count de Limonat. Next letter, Thomas Clarkson to King Henry, dated September 7th, 1819. I had the honor of writing to your majesty in June last by Mr. Davis in answer to your letter relative to a treaty with France. And I now send you a duplicate of that letter by Mr. Burt to whom I feel much obliged for his politeness in giving me timely notice of his intention to return to Haiti. Since that time, Mr. Velvic has again introduced the island of Haiti to the notice of the Chamber of Representatives of France. He read a report there, which was so far approved of that it was ordered to be printed and to be recommended to the attention of the King's ministers. He advised France to use a liberal policy towards the chiefs of Haiti. He had no objection to acknowledge their independence, but he expected that they, on their part, should pay a sum of money to France as an indemnification to the ex-colonists for the loss of property which they had experienced in consequence of the revolution, and also that they should allow to France the advantage of their commerce. As the report of Mr. Velvic seemed to be generally, if not universally approved of, I should suppose that the ministers of Louis XVIII would offer to your majesty and to General Boyer a treaty upon this basis. The report now mentioned was read at the Chambas at the latter end of the month of July. I need scarcely observe that the sentiments of Monsieur Velvic having appeared in the public journals have become known throughout all of France. Your Majesty will find, on reading over my last letter to you, that I did not anticipate Monsieur Velvic's idea of an indemnification to the ex-colonists. This new idea has greatly altered the face of things since I last wrote to you. For it should consent to you to pay to France an indemnification. You ought to consider such a payment as the price paid for the acknowledgement of your independence. And if this be so, you will have a right to demand of France not only a free trade, but you will have a right to insist upon her finding a guarantee. It is the business of France if she receives the money and not yours to find a proper security for it. And in this case, it might be advisable to tell her that you yourself would give the preference to Great Britain. Should such a treaty as that proposed by Mr. Velvic be offered to you, it becomes an important question with your majesty whether you ought to accept it. It is my sincere advice to you to accept an indemnification in exchange for the acknowledgement of your independence and to demand of France in return of a guarantee and a free trade in which she may participate like all other nations. I take it for granted, however, that the indemnification will be reasonable and moderate, and such as you can pay without any great sacrifice, either at once or by installments in a course of years. My reasons for giving you this advice are the following. Number one, it is a fact that a great number of the ex-colonists are reduced to beggary, and they depend on themselves pensions from the French government for their support. These men are constantly troubling for money and for urging it to acts of hostility against Haiti for the recovery of what they lost. Now, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Thomas Clarkson basically said all the former plantation owners back in Haiti, they are now in France. They live on government welfare. They damn near homeless in the street. They hungry. They lost everything. They broke. They down to their last dimes. And they were the ones lobbying the French government to go invade Haiti to recover their lost estates, to recover their plantations, because they are literally depending on welfare and charity for the government. They went from being, you know, multimillionaire, multi-billionaire plantation owners to now, you know, living off the government. Damn near about to lose their house, about to be homeless, you know, eating out garbage in the streets. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, let's get back into it. This is one reason why the French government hesitates to acknowledge your independence. For if they were to acknowledge your independence, then the ex-colonists, losing all hope of recovering their property in Haiti, it would have the burden of supporting them and their families forever. Damn. So pretty much, we had to pay a tribute to France and give up our commerce to France because the only other option that France had was to basically pay welfare to the ex-colonists forever, essentially. So we had to pay the debt. We had to pay the tax because the French government did not want to pay the tax. So somebody had to pay it. So they said, you know, let the Negroes pay it. 
you know, it is what it is. Like I said, morality does not exist in the world. Morality is fake. Let's get back into it. By agreeing, therefore, to an identification, you would thus remove a constant source of discord between you and the French government. Number two, you would not only get your independence acknowledged by France, but secure it also. And let me observe that no nation after this would hesitate to acknowledge you as an independent state. You will never probably have an opportunity of making peace on such a fair and honorable terms as under the reign of Louis XVIII. England would be more likely to become a guarantor at his particular request than she would hereafter at the request of his successors. Number four, France, by means of the frugal and wise administration of Louis XVIII, is increasing her finances and her power in a manner far exceeding the calculations of politicians, so that in a few years she will become by far the most powerful nation in Europe, and I could wish that your majesty should make a treaty with her before she assumes so powerful an attitude. I have communicated my views on this subject, both to Mr. Wilberforce and Mr. Stephen, and I am happy to announce to your majesty that they concur with them cordially. If I should collect any farther intelligence from France, I will omit no opportunity of sending it to you. You may rely upon my constant vigilance for the good of Haiti and upon the best effort to promote it. I have the honor to be with great respect and esteem, your majesty's friend, Thomas Clarkson. Next letter, King Henry to Thomas Clarkson, dated September 10th, 1819. My esteemed friend, the ill health of our dear mutual friend, Mr. Wilberforce, has multiple occupations and the trouble I have already caused him in the matter of choosing schoolmasters and professors for us all make me fear to importune him by asking for further services. I am therefore turning my eyes toward you as the friend best placed to understand our needs in the field of education. I therefore beg of you to do us the favor of securing two professors of belles lettres in the French and English languages, men who are well prepared and to be recommended for their ideas, their behavior and their character. I want to place them in the Royal College of Haiti. We need these two professors, especially since the departure of Mr. Morton had brought to a stop the education of the young people who had been confided to his care. Mr. Morton asked for and obtained permission to leave because of illness. It will indeed be a great favor, my friend, if you will find these two professors for me as soon as possible. To that end, I authorize you to sign an agreement with them for seven years, under the terms of which each of them will be paid a yearly salary of 2,000 goods beginning on the day of their arrival. Their own traveling expenses, as well as those of their family and children they may bring with them, will be paid by the government. Also, their return passage to England will be provided for upon the expiration of their contract. Out of the 3,000 goods, which will be paid to them regularly each month in cash, at the rate of 250 goods per month, they must provide food and lodging for themselves and their families, since the government does not attempt to provide food and housing for the schoolmasters and professors in its employ. They will be honorably treated and will enjoy in Haiti all the consideration which their profession permits. These then, my friend, are the conditions you may incorporate in us, the agreement you may eventually sign with these two professors. I have full confidence in your choice, for I know you will pick out only such men as we can use. Allow me to renew the expression of my highest esteem and warm friendship. Henry. Next letter, Duke de Limonade to Thomas Clarkson. As we know, Duke de Limonade, the Lieutenant General of the King's Army, Commander of the Royal and Military Order of St. Henri, the Major of the Light Horse of the Prince Royal, Secretary of State, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you know what I'm saying, big dog got like a million titles, you know what I'm saying, in other words, you know what I'm saying, big gangster, big chief, big dog status in the Kingdom of Haiti, let's get into it, Duke de Limonat to Thomas Clarkson, Instructions for Thomas Clarkson. Mr. Thomas Clarkson is authorized to point out to the French government that in the midst of war of 30 years duration, the Haitian people, after shedding rivers of its finest blood, set itself up. 16 full years ago as a sovereign state, free and independent, exercising its natural rights, the nation proclaimed its independence before all men by solemn declaration on the 1st of January, 1804. Since that great and glorious day, the Haitian nation has created itself a stable and regular government, national institutions, a system of laws, a new and enlightened generation is replacing the former population. The ideas, morals, customs, and even the habits of the people have undergone a total change. In a word, nothing any longer exists of the former regime. A constitutional and hereditary monarchy has been established, as has an order of nobility and a military order. An army and an agricultural system has been set up. The plantations, lands, houses, and other property, which the ex-colonists owned in the cities and country, have been given away, divided, or sold. Everything has changed. The colonial regime has been overthrown, destroyed from top to bottom. The last vestiges of that odious system have disappeared from the soil of Haiti. Ooh, yo, Duke de Luanat talk, yo, he talking big ducks that, I don't know, listen, listen, got, remember, 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 this is the instructions he gave to Thomas Clarkson. So I'm assuming Thomas, he about to be, you know what I mean, running around doing business in Europe. So the Duke de Luanat is basically giving him instructions. On what to do and as we can see you know big duke he talking that talk right now you know he beating on his chest right now you know let's get back into it 
For 16 years, the subjects of all maritime and trading nations have carried on the commerce with Haiti. These activities and mutual interchanges are in fact equivalent to a tacit, if not formal, recognition of our independence. Nothing then remains for the Haitian government but to be solemnized by treaties of independence which has already been implicitly recognized by the nations, been consecrated by the passage of time, and by the institutions and privileges the people possess by right of conquest in a bloody and cruel war. The events which led to our independence are best not recalled here, but they are known to the entire world, reinforce the cause of the Haitian people, and are more than efficient justification for the separation of Haiti from their previous mother country. We have always felt that France, faced with such powerful arguments and moved by sentiments of justice and humanity, must unhesitatingly recognize by a solemn treaty an independence which she herself made inevitable, and which can, in no possible way, be destroyed, as is clearly evident to every reasonable observer. It was then, with great astonishment, grief, and regret, that we have seen her insist on maintaining her claims against Haiti, claims which are now meaningless and without foundation. France's former rights as the mother country of Haiti ceased to exist 16 years ago by the very fact of our conquest of the island and the act of independence by which the nation declared itself a free and sovereign state. Under existing circumstances, any political or commercial relations between the people and the governments of the two countries have been and are impossible and will continue so until the respective rights have been stipulated and recognized in a formal treaty. This situation has brought about a painful state between the two nations. One might say a state of permanent hostility, equally disadvantageous to the commerce and prosperity of both. His Haitian majesty, impelled by sentiments of humanity and justice, wishes to recover the basis upon which a solid and durable peace may be built and thus bring an end to an unfortunate state of affairs in a way mutually beneficial to Haiti and France, and the overture which His Haitian Majesty has decided to make through his esteemed and worthy friend, Mr. Thomas Clarkson, it is his wish to give unmistakable proof to His Christian Majesty of his deference, and to demonstrate his ardent desire to restore peace and commercial relations between the two countries. In the negotiations to be undertaken, His Majesty is leaving to the discretion of Mr. Thomas Clarkson the choice of the means and avenues to approach. In case Mr. Clarkson's efforts are successful and it proves possible to proceed to drawing up a draft of the treaty, the negotiator should demand as indispensable conditions, number one, that His Christian Majesty, King of France, recognize Haiti as a free, sovereign, and independent state, that he deals with Haiti as such, and that on his own behalf and in the name of the heirs and successors, he renounces all claims to political, property, and territorial rights over Haiti or any part thereof. Once this condition has been agreed upon, the negotiator may offer in return, second, that France will share in the commerce of Haiti as a most favored nation, third, that in case of a European war, Haiti will observe the strictest neutrality toward the belligerent powers, fourth, that steps will be taken to arrange between France and Haiti a commercial treaty safeguarding the interests of both countries. A treaty embracing these conditions would be not only just and equitable, but equally honorable and advantageous to the contracting party. In no real sense would it represent a sacrifice for France to recognize the independence of Haiti. Any sacrifice involved was made 16 years ago and was necessitated by the forced circumstances. By performing now an act of justice and humanity, France would secure the evident advantage of sharing in our commerce on our most favored nation footing. In considering the terms of the proposed treaty, we have disregarded the following matters as inadmissible. Number one, any payment of indemnification of the ex-colonists. Number two, any claim for exclusive rights to our commerce. Number three, the existing difficulties between the northern and southern parts of Haiti. Nevertheless, since these different questions may be brought up, we must submit our answers, so the negotiator may be in a position to discuss them authoritatively. The negotiator will point out that the ex-colonists were banished by the laws of Haiti, that as outlaws, their former property was confiscated, their goods were given away, divided and sold. Their present legal owners not only shed their blood to earn a right to this property, but have invested enormous sums of money in making it again productive, since most of it was burned or destroyed during the civil wars which were waged on the island. What rights, what arguments can the ex-colonists then allege to justify their claims of a payment? Is it possible that they wish to be recompensated for the loss of our persons? It is inconceivable that Haitians who have escaped torture and massacre at the hands of these men, Haitians who have conquered their own country by the force of arms and the cost of their blood, these same free Haitians should now purchase their property and persons once again with money paid to their former enemies? It is not possible. It is not for one moment to be considered. Free men could never accept such a condition without covering themselves with infamy. The ex-colonists are our natural enemies. They tortured us when it was their power to do so, and they never stopped to seek an opportunity to renew the torture. It would therefore be altogether unjust and unreasonable to ask the Haitian government to come to the aid of such men. In the face of such powerful reasons, we feel confident that the question of a payment to the ex-colonists be disposed of. 
This was the official statement given by Christophe's government when the French government wanted a payment to the ex-colonists, the ex-slaveholders. When Christophe died and the kingdom was overthrown and General Baye from the south and the rest of the mulattoes came to power, they agreed to pay the money. OK, so this is how the payment was made. It wasn't a case of, oh, the French came with warships and then we ran out with a bag of money and gave it to them. No, no. It was two governments on the island, the kingdom of Haiti in the north. They said no. And in fact, they actually assassinated the French ambassador in 1814. This is now 1819, five years after they assassinated the French ambassador. They said, again, we're not paying you a damn dime. Everything we got, we paid by the force of arms and the spilling of blood in the south. They agreed to pay the money. And when they came to power and started ruling over the whole island, five years later, 1805, 1825, five years after Christoph died, that is when the treaty was arranged and the mulattoes agreed to pay a tribute to France every year. And we paid that payment for over 100 years until the 1940s. Let's get back into it. With regard to the second matter, exclusive rights to our commerce. The negotiator will observe, number one, that any free, sovereign, and independent state must be the master of its own commerce. Number two, it would be unjust to exclude now from all trade these nations which have maintained commercial relations with us for the last 16 years. And number three, that an exclusive commerce with France would be contrary to our laws and best interests. It would then be impossible for us to grant any nation exclusive rights to our trade. Justice, fairness, and good faith require that the government of his Haitian majesty should treat all countries favorably and on equal footing as we expect them to treat us. Now, keep in mind, this is not Christoph talking. This is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. You know what I'm saying? Duke de Limonat. He's talking to Thomas Clarkson. Let's get back into it. We feel that France should be satisfied to share in our commerce as a most favored nation. There is no doubt that, sharing thus, she would stand to profit enormously. The special protection which we accord agriculture and the resulting increase in our productivity, as well as the immense consumption of European manufactured goods by a rapidly growing population, cannot but render commercial relations between the two nations more and more lucrative. Regarding the third question, the present difficulties existing between the northern and southern parts of Haiti, the negotiator should point out, number one, the momentary division of the country is a family matter, which is of no concern to a foreign government. Number two. Our Declaration of Independence, the 1st of January, 1804, declares one and indivisible, both the territory and the cause of the Haitian people. Number three, there is, therefore, nothing to prevent His Haitian Majesty from signing a treaty in the name of all Haitians, provided that he takes as his point of his departure, the declaration by which both parties are eternally bound. In wishing to negotiate for the entirety of Haiti, His Majesty has no intention of trying to extend his government over the southern part of the country, but rather feels that he is bound by his honor and patriotism to further the highest interests of the entire nation. Consequently, any attempt, proposition, or demand which would require him to depart from this point of view would be regarded as inadmissible, for the simple reason that the cause and the territory of the Haitian people are one and indivisible. Though His Haitian Majesty is deposed to find a way of overcoming any difficulties which may present themselves, there are certainly cardinal points such as those just enumerated, which he can neither surrender or compromise. For further guidance, His Majesty refers his honored friend, Mr. Thomas Clarkson, to the principles expressed in his declaration on the 20th of November, 1816. His Majesty cannot depart one iota from these principles. Mr. Clarkson now knows the intentions of the Haitian government and the conditions under which it would sign a treaty. When he has learned those of the French government, if there is substantial agreement between the two parties, he will draw up a draft, which will afford to me. So I may in turn submit it to my government as the basis for a definitive agreement. Duke de Limonat. Reincarnated, I'm back in original fashion. I left on a horse and came back in that ass. And I left with abundance and came back to famine. We used to be pyramids, now we be rapping. Look how the mighty have fallen. Used to be running, now we be walking. When you be cooning, that's when they applaud it. Selling your soul, your sons and your daughter. Gotta come up in this shit. They stuck in the mix. Really, my heart would be breaking. That's why I'm stacking that paper and handle my business. Pass it down in generation. Talking about money and power and building a nation. That's a deadly combination. Never be watching the TV, they pushing the genders. Falsifying information. No, they got malice intentions. Step in the room and I'm feeling the tension. Enemy watching me, blocking my vision. Pay for the check, cause I need my redemption. Building my kingdom, I need to protect it. Ready for war like a young money Congo. Never decided the team is the motto. Up in the crib and I'm whipping up waffles. Up in the crib and I'm smoking gelato. I'm chilling, I'm taking my pain and make it ambition. I'm blessed by the gods, but I ain't religious. I came for the power, they came for the bitch. They making no hourly wage. I got business. This shit is an art. And they can never be taught Selling my soul I can never be bought Play with my money
money, I see you ain't caught. Run to the check and I do it for sport. Babylon falling, I go to the source. Packing my luggage and go overseas. Shorty be with me and she so elite. Shorty be chosen, I'm calling her Hershey. Secret intelligence probably gon' murder me. Don't fuck with brands, cause nigga, I'm Haitian. Say the wrong shit and you're smacking it.